Hello, and welcome to another episode of Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, collectively and individually, past, present, sometimes future. I'm Alan Cozen, the co-author of the new The McCartney Legacy, 1969 to 1973, and also The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And And I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and a co-host of the solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk, which I just did this afternoon as a guest. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. Um, he has his own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which is packed with Beatles related interviews and all kinds of other stuff that he'll tell you about at the end. Hello, Ken. Hi, Alan. You and I both doing double duty today. Yeah, really. And also Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUVFM 90.7 in the New York area since February 1984. Um, if you're not in the vicinity of the New York area, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. Uh, there is a button telling you exactly that if you're watching the YouTube version. Yes, it just happens to be right here. What a coincidence. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Alan. Ken, great to see you again. Hello, Beetle friends. <laughs> hey. So today we're going to do a show about um, some of our favorite Beatles covers, uh, meaning covers of Beatles songs by other people. And um, I think we'll have some unusual stuff because I know in in my case, and I think at least in Darren's, if not also in Ken's, um, we sort of were looking for unusual things rather than necessarily best or favorite things so um we'll get to that after the news and for that we turn to ken thank you alan uh number of things to get to in the last few weeks first of all this book called the mccartney legacy volume one 1969 to 73 has been nominated for the 2023 association for Recorded Sound Collections Awards for Excellence in Historical Recorded Sound Research. Hmm. Takes a long time to say. Congrats to the two authors, Adrian Sinclair and our own Alan Cozen for that. I put that all the way at the top, Alan. Number one news item. Thanks. (laughs) Well, I I, I hope you can report on us winning it. (laughs) (laughs) When will you know? Beats me. (laughs) Well, if we find out, we'll relay that back to everyone watching. Okay. Also, another honor for another author, our good friend Madeline Baccaro, who wrote the excellent book on Yoko, In Your Mind, The Infinite Universe of Yoko Ono, just got her book accepted as one of the books being sold at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Happening very quickly there. Such a fine book and just so thorough Mm -hmm. in talking about Yoko and... um, trying to explain her mind and how it works and all of her art and why she is important and has been important for so many years, important to John and for everyone discovering her and also in the avant-garde world and beyond that. Mm -hmm. Uh, We do more in the passing of Louise Harrison, Mm. George Harrison's sister who died on January the 30th at the age of 91 Louise moved to the United States back in the 50s, and her first husband was an engineer for a string of coal companies. They eventually ended up living in Benton, Illinois, and as many Beatle fans are aware, George, along with his brother Peter, came to the U.S. in 1963 to visit Louise in Benton, and George actually jammed with a local band while he visited here. Um in Benton. Uh, the Four Vests was the name of the band, and it was at the El Dorado VFW. George also went to his first drive in movie theater and he bought a Rickenbacker guitar while in town. Louise was very busy promoting the Beatles and trying to get local stations to play them. She actually got one radio station in Illinois to play their latest single at the time, 
which was from me to you. And shortly after that, a few months later, the Beatles arrived in New York, and we all know what happened after that, expl exploding all over the world and being on the Ed Sullivan Show. Louise released an album in 1964 on a small record label called Recar Records, based out of Minneapolis. The album was called All About the Beatles. She had struggles with her personal life, and her marriage ended in divorce. She moved from Benton to Missouri. At one point, she lived in Connecticut and eventually landing in Florida. Um, and uh, she released her own autobiography in the year 2014 called My Kid Brothers Band, a.k.a. The Beatles. And she also managed a Beatles and British invasion group called Liverpool Legends. She dialed while she was in an assisted living facility in Florida. Now, George was the youngest of four children. He had the one sister, Louise, and two brothers, Peter and Harry. And Harry is actually the lone survivor. He is 89 years old as we speak. Sad news about Louise there. A short video of Paul and Ringo dancing next to each other was shared on social media as they attended Stella's Adidas party last Thursday night at Henson Recording Studios in Los Angeles. Ringo posted the video and it's quoted as saying, man, this beautiful day is getting better and better. We were at the Stella McCartney roller skating party. <laughs> what a time we had. Go get them, Paul. Peace and love. Also on hand were Julian Lennon, uh, Kate Hudson, Anja Taylor-Joy, and Dave Grohl at this party. Seems like in the past two weeks, we've had some major news stories concerning Paul McCartney. Breaking news from two days ago is that there will be a documentary on Paul's life after the Beatles in the works right now to be called Man on the Run. And Oscar-winning filmmaker Morgan Neville will be working on it. This will be a joint collaboration between Paul's company, MPL Communications, and Polygram Entertainment, the film and TV division of UMG, the Universal Music Group. This documentary will feature never-before-seen material and new interviews. It's being described as the definitive document of Paul's emergence from the dissolution of the world's biggest band and his triumphant creation of a second decade of musical milestones, a brilliant and prolific stretch. Neville won an Oscar for the film 20 Feet from Stardom and also worked on the documentary Roadrunner, a film about Anthony Bourdain, as well as the recent Tom Hanks film on Mr. Rogers, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Neville is a self-proclaimed Beatles fanatic and McCartney obsessive. And he says, I was too young to buy Beatle records when they came out, but I could buy Wings records, and I love them. To me, the story of what happened to Paul in the wake of the Beatles when he had to rediscover himself is the story that has never been told. Unless, of course, you happen to have picked up the McCartney legacy. <laughs> yeah, I think it's been told. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, it's been told by Paul himself a number of times. Yeah. So, um, Like Wingspan, for one. It is kind of ironic that, you know, and we don't really know when this is coming out. There's no release date for yeah. it, but that the news would break on this at the same time as Paul and Adrian are enjoying success with their book. Another big news item since our last show is learning that Paul McCartney will be releasing a book of photos that he took of the Beatles from late 1963 and early 1964 that he thought were lost for many years and he rediscovered them. In 2020, what a find this was. It's almost a thousand photographs that Paul took on his 35 millimeter camera. The book itself will be called 1964 Eye of the Storm, and it will contain 275 photos from this period. A very significant, a significant time because it was when Beatlemania erupted in the UK. And after their first U.S. visit, they became the most famous people on the planet. It will cover photos from six cities. Liverpool, London, Paris, New York, Washington, D.C., and Miami. There'll also be commentary from Paul where he conveys his impressions of Britain and America in 1964. It'll be published by Penguin Books. That's 336 pages, and it's due out June 13th this year. Before I even heard about this book, I already learned that there would be a photo exhibit of these same photos to take place in London at the National Portrait Gallery to help mark 
They're reopening in June after a three-year refurbishment. It'll run there from June 28th to October the 1st. <clears throat> in more news, legendary artist Dolly Parton just turned 77 on January 19th, and she announced that she is making a new album due out sometime this year to be called Rockstar, after having been honored to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which originally she rejected because she never thought of herself as a rock and roller. She is getting together many rock icons to record with, and Paul McCartney will be on the album, as will Stevie Nicks, John Fogarty, Steve Perry, Steven Tyler, and others. The plan is to cover classic songs with these artists, and she says she and Paul will be singing a song together. Also, something else that we found out just recently, um, Ian Hunter has a brand new album coming out April the 21st called Defiance Part 1, and it includes the song Bed of Roses with Ringo on drums and Mike Campbell on guitar. The song is all about the Star Club in Hamburg. It is an excellent rocker, and there's a new video that you can find on YouTube. Ian has a star-studded cast on this album, including two recently departed rock stars. Jeff Beck is on there, mm. and Taylor Hawkins. Other stars include Johnny Depp, Billy Gibbons, Todd Rundgren, Joe Elliott, Jeff Tweedy, Slash, and Wadi Wachtel. The album will be coming out on Sun Records. Mm -hmm. And it is now available for pre-order. All right. So I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the last show, but the Weaklings just released their new single, which is a cover of the Beatles song, I've Just Seen a Face. And they've made a new video of the song, which has the band performing on a rooftop. Hmm. Where'd they get that idea from? <laughs> it also features Beatles podcaster Skylar Moody playing guitar on it. Really? Oh, nice. And we have a few other passings to note. Well, since our last show, it seems like a while ago already, but of course we have to mention David Crosby. Mm -hmm. Crosby was part of the legendary band The Birds, who had their own sound, but was certainly influenced by the Beatles. After watching the Beatles' first film, A Hard Day's Night, Roger McGuinn went and bought a Rickenbacker 12-string guitar. And David Crosby bought a Gretsch Tennessean that George played. Uh, George's song, If I Needed Someone, was influenced by the Birds' Bells of Rimney, and Crosby said that he introduced George to Ravi Shankar, who introduced Harrison to the sitar. And George gave Crosby the cape that he wore in the film Help. David got to visit the Beatles at Abbey Road when they had finished the Sgt. Pepper sessions. He is quoted as saying, I walked in, and they were acting silly and strange and having fun, because I think they were thrilled with what they had done. They knew what they had created. They sat me down in the middle of a room on a stool, and they were laughing about it. They rolled over two of those huge coffin-sized speakers up on either side of me, and then they played me a day in the life. And when they got to the end of the piano chord, man, I was dishrag. I was floored. It took me several minutes to be able to talk after that. End of quote. One of David's best quotes ever was when someone tried to compare the birds to the Beatles. And he said, the birds weren't bug spray to the Beatles. <laughs> as far as covering Beatles music, Crosby, Stills, and Nash covered the songs Blackbird and In My Life. And at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame 25th anniversary concert, Crosby, Nash, and Paul Simon performed Here Comes the Sun. Also, David Crosby released a song he wrote called Laughing off his album, If I Could Only Remember My Name. He said it was, quote, written to and for George Harrison about the Maharishi. And the idea was telling him that nobody's really got the answer and that people who try to tell you that they have the answer are most often trying to manipulate you. Graham Nash and Joni Mitchell contribute beautiful background vocals to the song. Members of the Grateful Dead are also on that one. And Stephen Stills released an album in 1975 called Stills with a song called As I Come of Age, which not only had David Crosby and Graham Nash on it, but Ringo on drums. And that song actually was recorded in 71, but released on uh, the Stills album four years later. 
We also mourn the loss of Barrett Strong. He was the original artist and co-writer behind the song Money, which, of course, the Beatles covered and John Lennon performed at the Live Peace in Toronto concert. Barrett wrote the song with Barry Gordy and Janet Bradford. Barrett was one of Motown's original hit makers, and he co-wrote with the songwriting partner for Motown, Norman Whitfield, many classic Motown songs, like I Heard It Through the Grapevine. Uh, War and uh, hits for the Temptations, like Just My Imagination, Ball of Confusion, mm -hmm. which mentions the Beatles, mm -hmm. and this other song called Cloud Nine the one by the temptations barrett strong was 81 and you had just told me alan that you learned of another passing and that being uh tim geelan yeah. one of the engineers for ram yeah basically the 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 chief engineer for the beginning of the sessions i mean the ram sessions had uh, you know several parts there's uh, at CBS in New York, then at a &R to do uh, orchestral overdubs and some other overdubs. And then they went to LA. Tim Geelan was the engineer at the CBS uh, section. And uh, yeah, you know, I interviewed him for the, for the McCartney legacy. Uh, there are a number of quotes from him in there about, about working on Ram and things that they had to do. And uh, um, he seemed like a, really nice guy said he told me that the very first thing he ever recorded was the flamingos i only have eyes for you which <laughs> uh, um for, it's not on right now but a few months ago there was a commercial on yeah. every 10 minutes on tv that had that recording um so anyway he, he I, recorded that uh he en engineered uh, a tape op or an engineer wow. for, for that mm -hmm. yeah it was his first job in the record industry. Very cool. Yeah. Um, and he worked on, you know, tons of, of stuff during his CBS years. And he, he uh, did some production work later on as well. So, um, yeah. Anyway, just thought we should acknowledge that since there's a definite Beatles connection. Sure. He didn't do any of the um, engineering with the orchestral parts then? No, no. That okay. was, uh, that was at A&R and, uh, out of his area by then uh have to say um one of the engineers at a and r told us that uh you know they considered themselves sort of the you know young new adventurous kind of studio and they considered cbs kind of like you know the old guys but <laughs> um he said when all of the ram tapes came to a and r he played through them all to see what condition they were in and he was uh pleasantly surprised at how well they were recorded so that goes to tim geelan too okay very yeah. nice yeah. well that's all the news i have for you this time okay so um on to some of our favorite beatles covers um beatles covers it's kind of a a funny thing. I mean, for a long time, I didn't pay an awful lot of attention to them because I'm um, being sort of a in, in, <laughs> in this an originalist. Um, you know, to me, it was yeah, I want to hear the Beatles. I don't really want to hear someone do it. But you know, over the years, I sort of came to realize that people had done a lot of creative things with Beatles songs over the years, and I now on my. Uh, iTunes equivalent, which is called Media Monkey, have actually 4,000 tracks of Beatles covers. Wow. So choosing these <laughs> was really kind of tough because I didn't listen to all 4,000 again, but I sort of, you know, paged through them and stopped and listened to, you know, bunches of them. And there were, uh, you know, there is so much great stuff including foreign language stuff, which I didn't pick any of. I don't know if either of you did, but, um, you know, for instance, one of the things I ran into was Petula Clark doing Please Please Me in French. Huh. I can't remember what it was called. It wasn't called uh, Please Please Me. And, and, and the lyrics, I mean, I don't really speak French, but, you know, understand little bits. And uh, one of the lyrics that went by was, we, we, we. Anyway, and we know that in Please Please Me, there are no yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know what that was about, but. Wee, wee, uh, wee, wee, wee. <laughs> so, um, so who should we start with? Any volunteers? 
of the two of you. Okay, Darren. <laughs> Don't matter. Oh, there you go. I get picked. All right. My list started organized and just became a little hodgepodge of things that were just popping into my head. Um, for so many years at WFUV, I used to uh, host a segment called Under the Covers. And this goes back to when I was doing Morning Drive, which was uh, the shift changed the time. <coughs> excuse me. Changed a, a couple of times, but it was generally speaking 6 to 10 a.m. Monday through Friday. And we came up with the idea of doing a set of covers uh calling it under the covers very clever and then it, i think it was it was at six o'clock most people still want to be under the covers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly I, I don't remember what time i used to do it but uh and then and i think dwight yoakam put out an album called under the covers and i used to complain about that dwight it's my name it's my <laughs> show name anyway when i moved to middays we kept the name even though it was now a 12 noon feature only because everyone knew it as under the covers um and that went the wayside when i moved to evenings so um many times i was doing beatles stuff and i really wished i would have kept like notes on what i played in those sets because it would have made this a lot easier uh so i had to do a lot of banging my head against the wall trying to remember some of the things that um that i played and some of the things that really stuck with me and uh, this is very random. I'm mean, not even referring to this as my favorites. Uh, they're amongst my favorites because I know there are some that I love that didn't pop into my head the past couple of weeks while we were toying with this being a show topic and I was starting to scribble ideas down. Uh, and my list, uh, I don't even know how many songs are here. Um, it, 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 my list includes two albums which you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, I'm wondering if, if if either one of you might think what I what one or both of them might be. We'll see when we get there. I, I think I know. I, I I'm, gonna st- I'm gonna start off with two versions of uh George Harrison's It's All Too Much. Mm-hmm. Uh coincidentally enough, and I didn't realize this until I was making this list for this show, both versions came out in nineteen seventy six. And both were on the second album by this particular band and artist. Journey's second album, Look Into the Future, uh, features a great version of It's All Too Much. And I'm not much of a Journey fan, but I do like their first three albums, the ones that people don't pay any attention to anymore, free Steve Perry. But... um, from Look Into the Future, Journey, uh, uh, their version of It's All Too Much, and a guitarist by the name of Steve Hillage, mm. um, who was in... Top of my list. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. He used to be in a band called Gong. <laughs> and he uh, his second solo record was called L, and uh, had a great psychedelic freak-out version of It's All Too Much. And he's a guy actually then from that and playing that in the middle of the night in the 80s on WFUV during our overnights back in the early days for me. Um, Those were the kinds of little trips that I would go on at like three in the morning, you know, pulling out Steve Hillage albums and curved air and weird stuff like that. Um, Were you a Gong fan? I'm sorry? Were you a Gong fan? I didn't know. I still don't know them that well. Mm. I just never had the time to sink my teeth into them. Um, yeah, they were out there. They were really yeah, out there. Yeah. <laughs> but the Steve Hillage thing, I don't even remember how I found it. I probably was just going through the WFEV record library. And um, I think one of the members of Pink Floyd, I think, think possibly Nick Mason, produced something of Steve Hillage's and I went looking maybe for that album found L instead and oh look he covers it so too much let me give it a listen and and it stuck neither of these guys are going to pick that one it's just way too off the edge and, right. and the then very first go. thing that you mentioned Steve Hillage. <laughs> and he's like this big he's not a household name but he's in completely different world today so he's an electronic musician i think today mm-hmm. like electronic dance some completely far completely different world from like the 70s prog 
psychedelic prog stuff that he used to do. Hmm. But anyway, so that's two versions of It's All Too Much, Journey and Steve Hillage. One that probably, it's possible one of you picked this. This is um, probably the best known cover on my list. Stevie Wonders, We Can Work It Out. Mm -hmm. um, that's That might be my favorite of all of them. Uh, from 1970, the signed, sealed, and delivered album. Um, he didn't completely reinvent that song, but he made it a Stevie Wonder song so cleverly, and it's catchy as hell. And um, uh, so it's it's on my list here. And then there's um, Adrian guitarist Adrian Ballou. Um, Adrian Ballou did a version of Free as a Bird, uh, which was uh, mm -hmm. released in 1998 on an album called Blue Prince, the acoustic Adrian Blue, volume two, as Alan gets his list because he picked it. No, I'm writing this down. Oh, okay. <laughs> Me too. Uh, I want to remember the circumstances that this... No, you know what I think it is? I think I'm mixing two different things up here. Free as a Bird was released with the Beatles anthology, and that was 1994, late 94? Five, 95. It was 95, Okay. Um, I think, I think King, King Crimson were on tour at that time. Maybe it was Baloo touring solo, but I heard that he performed Free as a Bird within a day or two of the broadcast. He loved it so much. And he did it, I think, solo. Well, in 98, he put out Blue Prince, uh, the acoustic Adrian Blue volume two, which had a live version recorded in New York at the Long Acre Theater. I don't know if it's the performance that I read about, but uh, Adrian Ballou, nice, simple, straightforward. If you know Ballou, this is this is Ballou very kind of like just with, I don't know if it was acoustic, but wait a minute. The album's called The Acoustic Adrian Ballou, Volume 2. Chances are it was some sort of acoustic thing, but it's very sweet. Oh. Um Rufus Wainwright uh, covered Across the Universe. I got one of yours, Ken? Yes. You got two of mine already. We can work it out the other, right? Yep. You got it. Um, Rufus Wainwright is an incredibly talented singer whose career has taken him all over the map. He's a little, he's from album to album, he's in a completely different world. He contributed Across the Universe to the I Am Sam soundtrack, which is all Beatle covers. Mm -hmm. and stands alone as a really cool Beatle tribute album. I've never seen the movie, actually, mm -hmm. uh, I Am Sam, but um, the soundtrack, I've played it many times, uh, with Rufus Wainwright doing Across the Universe from, uh, from, from 2002, for those of you who want to know the year. And this is one that uh, Ken mentioned before, unbe you know, uh, totally by coincidence, and it was uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash's version of In My Life. Oh, yeah. Now, they did, there was a couple of records. There was one Crosby, Stills, and Nash album called Live It Up, and which had hot dogs on the cover. It was a really weird album cover. <laughs> and before that, there was the, uh, the Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young album, American Dream which came out in, in 88, you know, and you did have like, uh, I know the Graham Nash and Stephen Stills did solo albums around this time. It was a very thin period because all of those records that were coming out weren't all that good. They had some decent songs in them. Some of these albums were really weighed down with 80s production. Um, I think uh, Stephen Stills' album was Right By You. And Graham Nash had innocent eyes. So I had sort of, when it was a new thing coming from the Crosby, Stills, Nash camp, I didn't really expect much of anything at that time. Well, in 94, they put out an album called After the Storm that really not too many people paid. I think it made it onto the charts and barely cracked the top 100. Um, it was on Atlantic. It was produced by Glenn Johns after the storm and featured a re some really nice songs on that album, including the title track and their version of In My Life. So um, people know they do Bluebird. 
uh, uh, not Bluebird, Blackbird. They've mm-hmm. covered Blackbird. In fact, there's a live version. There's probably more than one floating around out there. Uh, but In My Life was always very nicely done, very uh, sweet from uh, an album that is was a pleasant surprise when it came out because it came after, um, you know, some of these albums that were very spotty. Oh, Yes, I Can was Crosby's solo album in 89. And these albums didn't weren't as good as they could have been. And then after The Storm came out, I go, that's that's very nice. This is a good record. I'm one of the only people I know of that has it, unfortunately. <laughs> Two versions of Dear Prudence. Um, if you're into the Dead uh, or and or uh, Jerry Garcia Band, the album called Jerry Garcia Band's Essential came out in 91, live album, was only the second album released by the Jerry Garcia Band uh, and features an 11-minute version of Dear Prudence, which is terrific. Uh, and that's an essential album. I, I'm talking, if I'm talking to any deadheads out there, like you need me to tell you, there's this album called Jerry Garcia Band, and it's terrific. But that's where you'll find Dear Prudence. It was recorded in 1990, released a year later. And jazz pianist Brad Meldow, who I love. Um, the only problem with Brad Meldow for me is that he's got so much material out there. And sometimes he just it just kind of goes over my head some of his stuff, but he did an album in 2002 called Largo. Uh, and Largo has a version of Dear Prudence, he covers Radiohead uh, on that album. And that was a period where I was really getting into Brad Meldow. Um, and I want to close out by just throwing these two albums that I chose and we'll see if Ken knows what they are. Um, oh, both came out in 1970. Oh, okay. And you have... George Benson's The Other Side of Abbey Road Mm -hmm. um, with a picture of him crossing East 53rd Street in New York City. (laughs) Um, George, you couldn't get a shot crossing the Abbey Road for the cover. And uh, Booker T and the MGs doing their album Macklemore Avenue uh, as opposed to Abbey Road and the front cover, they're crossing Macklemore Avenue. And I'm assuming that's outside of the Stack Studios. Uh, I think it is. I think I think Stax was located on Macklemore Avenue in Memphis. And um, both those albums came out in 1970. They're not perfect albums. Some of the some of the renditions on them are a little. (laughs) But for the most part, they're really cool listens and uh, a nice alternate way to listen to. A Beatle album in another genre. So that's my list. Dems be my picks. Great. I actually thought when you said two albums that one of them would be I Am Sam. Yeah, you know what? I I, I, it, I don't know. It just didn't it it didn't strike me as one. I got to put that on my list. Hmm. It's not my like. It just didn't make my list. Uh, it's also been so long. I listened to it a lot when it was out. Um, and it, what what year did I say that it was? Two thousand two. Um, but it's been so long that I looked at the tracks on there and I actually can't remember some of them, which is weird. Um, but yeah, that's one folks you should check out if you haven't. Yep. Yep. And I have the movie too. I think I got it like with the, when the album came out, we were sent DVDs of the film and I I still haven't watched it all these years later with Michael, uh, Sean Penn. Yep. Michael Penn. (laughs) uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, I think. Yes, she's in there. The, Sean Penn was amazing in there, in that film. Yeah. And uh, lots of references to the Beatles all throughout that movie. Yeah, he liked the character he plays. Yeah. Found, like, comfort in Beatles music, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah, that was, um, I mean, just to, to go off on a, a slight tangent, uh an actor who has Beatles references in his films a lot is Dustin Hoffman. Um, think about in Hook, they come when they come back, you know, into the little girl's bedroom. She's got all Beatles memorabilia all over her her dresser because it's I guess the early sixties. Um, in um, what's the one where he's. Uh, where he's in drag to um 
Tootsie? Tootsie. In Tootsie, when he stays with Jessica Lang, she has that blue night blue uh, Beatles at the Palladium poster on her wall. Yeah. And in Rain Man, the central emotional scene is when they're filling up the bathtub and remembering as kids that they used to sing, I saw her standing there together. I think it was, I saw her standing there. So, um, and, and it, it seems to me that like, this can't be an accident. This one actor always has Beatles references in his films. Um, and they weren't all post 1973. I don't think maybe they were, maybe they were all after he met Paul in uh, Jamaica and, mm. and talked him into, uh, you know, challenged him to write Picasso's last words. Right. So anyway, maybe since we were talking about films, I thought I could get away with that um, bit of trivia. So, Ken, what's on your list? OK, well, kind of like what Darren said, the problem with doing something like this is I can come up with a whole bunch of covers that I like. But then you guys are going to mention so many others and I'll say, oh, I should have thought of that one. Mm -hmm. I wish I had a list of every cover version that I'm aware of. And um, also kind of like what you said, Alan, w when I was younger, I couldn't care less about Beatle covers at all. Nothing could compare to the the versions that the Beatles did. Mm -hmm. And I sure changed over the years. Part of it was to sp spice up my radio show, every little thing to have other things to put on there. But I came to realize that, you know, the biggest reason to me why the Beatles catalog has endured is because they're great songs first. And they have a life all their own. Mm -hmm. And um, as witnessed by so many cover versions, they lend themselves to so many different arrangements and interpretations. And uh, and I've certainly learned that from hearing so many different genres of music tackle the Beatles stuff from country to jazz, of course, rock. They're on children's albums, yep. you know, classical arrangements of Beatles songs. and. Um, so it made me appreciate the Beatles songs even more. Um, even still, it'd be tough for me to ever say any cover versions better than the Beatles version, but I sure have enjoyed so many other ones. Um, my favorite of all the Beatles covers, and it has been this for a long time, is Earth, Wind and Fire doing Got to Get You Into My Life. Okay. What you're going to find with all the songs that I, that I pick here is that I look for different arrangements of Beatles songs. To just copy what the Beatles did takes talent. There's no doubt about it. But to me, there's a part of me that says, what's the point? Right. You know, might as yeah. well listen to the Beatles do it. <laughs> if you get it. save that for a Beatles tribute band. And there's no doubt about it. it. It takes a lot of work to master what the Beatles did and to copy exactly um, the instrumentation, the harmonies, all that. But I'd rather hear somebody do their own interpretation and kind of make it their own and that's exactly what you're going to find with you know like i said just about every version every cover that i that i mentioned here um i like the funkiness of of got to get you into my life um it kind of says something when that version became a hit after the beatles version was a hit <laughs> 1976 the beatles recording was released when rock and roll music came out that was a top 10 single two years later earth wind and fire do the same song do it their own way and it was also a top 10 single from the sergeant pepper movie right um but i i just love what they did with it um i also gotta say i i do like uh, Fu on the Hill from Sergio Mendez in Brazil 66, which was also a top 10 uh, version think. of the song. And, you know, kind of a light uh, jazz, Latin feel to the song, which really works. And, I, you know, when it comes to Sergio Mendez, I love Lanny Hall, the lead vocalist, oh, yeah. who eventually married Herb Albert. And um, her voice helped to make a lot of those songs really special. Um You'll find that Sergio Mendez and Herb Albert covered a lot of Beatles songs, too. I also had to put Stevie Wonder in there with We Can Work It Out. There are actually some people who think his version's better than the Beatles version, yeah. but it certainly is different. There's no doubt about it. He put his own spin on it, made it his own song. It's a completely different arrangement of it, and uh, I just love what he did with it. Um, 
I had to put yes in there with every little thing. When you yeah. talk about, I, yeah, uh, don't tell me you forgot that, Alan. <laughs> I didn't, no, I didn't think of it, but that would that would have been a candidate. Yeah, well, you know, I, I do this little mini montage in my show, every little thing, and I play a little bit of their version, and um, you know, progressive rock version, very complicated, put a lot, ton of work into their own arrangement of it. And it's kind of what you would expect yes to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I love what what they did with the song. I also mentioned Rufus Wainwright as well. Um, I'm certainly no expert on his music, but anytime I've heard him on the radio, I've loved whatever he's he's done. And part of the reason why I love his music is because I love his singing voice. He has a voice that's very distinctive and you know who yeah. it is as soon as you hear it. And it, it really adds, you know, character to his songs and um just love the version of across the universe that he did from i am sam i put the buckinghams in there they covered i'll be back and uh you're familiar with the buckinghams music of the 60s and that big brass sound james gercio who we who uh we mentioned with the the ram sessions um that eventually led to working with chicago um yeah, I'll Be Back is what you would expect from the Buckinghams with a lot of brass around it, doing their own arrangement of the song. Many times it's like, if I told you a certain person covered this Beatles song, you could probably picture in your head what it sounds like. Nothing wrong with that. Um, and that certainly is the case with uh, not only the Buckinghams, but I've always enjoyed James Taylor's version of Day Tripper, which was on his album Flag. Again, James Taylor has a sound and a style and his arrangements are his own. Mm -hmm. And they're very different from the original versions of the songs that he's covered. Um, a bit of funk in there with the James Taylor version, but love what he did with it. Um, I guess I feel you have to say this. I, I've always liked Joe Cocker's with a little help from my friends, which, you know, a lot of people now point to as the definitive version I'll never say I love it more than the Beatles version, but you got to, you know, give Joe Cocker a lot of credit because you talk about a totally different arrangement. He did the song in three, four time in waltz time, you know, gave it a whole other, a whole other identity with that song. And, um, you know, since you associated so much with um, Woodstock and, and uh, certainly the wonder years, um, a lot of people look at that version as being the one that they point to. That's the version you go with. I like what um, he did with John Belushi on SNL. <laughs> you think of that too. Belushi did such a perfect version of Joe Cocker. The live Woodstock version is one of the great, I think, rock recorded rock moments yeah. ever. That scream. Mm. And with Henry McCullough, who gets on camera a couple of times. That's in, true. In the Grease Band. Yeah. yeah. At Woodstock. Okay. Well, uh, I don't know how you can include that, given, you know, all the, the praise that that version's gotten. And I, I do like it a lot. Um, I also got to put in uh, some props for the Carpenters. The Carpenters started off their career covering Ticket to Ride. And on the same album, they covered Help. And they were big Beatle fans. I also know they covered Goodnight later on. Um, and I love their version of it. They really slowed it down. And they turned it into a very melodic, pretty song with great harmonies. And uh, apart from Karen Carpenter's great singing voice, the arrangements of the Carpenter's music is something that you got to give him a lot of credit for if you love that kind of thing. And Richard Carpenter was very much involved with the arrangements of their songs. So he deserves a ton of credit too. Um, this is where Alan's going to want to leave the room. <laughs> What'd you do? <laughs> Stars on 45 medley. Oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> no, I love what they did. Okay. All right. So, you know, it came at a time when medleys were really big. It was the fad of the moment. Mm -hmm. And granted, it was on like a, it sounded like a tape loop, the same backing track in the same beat. And um, all those songs worked together really well as a medley. 
never understood why they had to put sugar sugar at the top of it <laughs> but all those songs strung together i think was done very well and it went to number one in america and uh i was a big fan of it i was very happy it showcased a lot of great Beatles songs all at once it probably turned a lot of young fans into Beatle fans just by hearing those songs um Gary U.S. Bonds did a version of It's Only Love, which I think was really very pretty, brought out the melody of it, was very soulful. I loved his version. When did uh, he do it? Um, I, I mean, think, like for decades. I think in the 80s, I think he did. Because he made a little little ladies comeback. Right. Was with this little girl, that. with uh, when Bruce Springsteen was working with him. Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. Um, yeah, but I liked his version of It's Only Love. You talk about different versions. Richie Valens is in a world to himself, and his version of Here Comes the Sun was great. Nobody else sounds like Richie Valens. You know, he has his own arrangement of songs, and uh, it's become, you know, it became a fairly big hit. It went top 20 here in America, but I love what Richie Valens did. I always liked Elton John's version of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because when he did it, I, I was a when it first came out, I was a little disappointed because it was slower than the Beatles version. I felt it dragged a lot. And because I got so used to his version, when I hear the Beatles version, it's too fast. But um, I like what he did with it, especially while well, he had John Lennon on there and that little reggae bit. You know, mm -hmm. towards the end, I thought it was kind of unique. Again, it's it's not a carbon copy of what the Beatles did. I don't want that. Um, I always liked the Mamas and Papas doing I Call Your Name. Again, great harmonies. Cass Elliot, great harmonies. Um, different, you know, piano-driven song there. Uh, I like that version. There's some jazz. I like some of the, the 60s jazz recordings of like ramsey lewis doing a hard day's night such a, a real light um comfortable feel like you're in a club there and you got this jazz combo in the background and that's what they're sounding like as an instrumental i like i like stuff like that also vince giraldi did something um with uh, a brazilian guitarist bullet i'm not sure how to pronounce his last name sete S -E -T. Sete, i think yeah yeah, did uh, a nice version of I'm a Loser. If you're familiar with Vince Giraldi, who did all the Charlie Brown music, mm -hmm. you know, it's exactly what you would expect, that that kind of style. I like Roseanne Cash. She did a really nice version of I Don't Want to Spoil the Party, mm -hmm. which, of course, lends itself towards a country arrangement, and it really works for her. One version that uh, of a Beatles song that I, I like to play every now and then, more than the others, is uh, Georgia Satellites doing Don't Pass Me By. They oh, wow. really rocked that song. And I think that was on their first album, if I'm not mistaken. But um, it's nice to see people covering something that Ringo wrote. And it really works as a rocker. Good, solid rocker. I, folks I never, watching I this should that. I never, check it out. I don't know that. Oh, yeah. You'd be surprised Whatever. how well that works. Um you know, the Beatles song, it had a country arrangement to it, which it works well with. But this is a flat out rocker, the way Georgia Satellites did it. There was uh, two women back in the 80s. Not sure how long they lasted. Sweethearts of the Rodeo. They were kind of an early version, kind yeah. of like the Judds. And uh, they put out a version of I Feel Fine, which was a fairly big hit on the country charts. And um, I think I'll throw in chad and jeremy who uh recorded i'll be back i just love their version because i love their harmonies it just works so well uh, on that particular song peter gabriel did a rather unusual version of strawberry fields forever which i've always enjoyed which is on all this in world war ii the soundtrack never saw the movie oh, yeah. but yeah for beatle fans it's all beatles music and uh i like what he did there and anything that lawrence juber has done <laughs> all of his uh beetle and actually did a, a an album of wing songs too that he covered i love his guitar and playing anything that he does who did you just say before peter gabriel uh chad and jeremy no you said something after that i think 
Sweethearts of the Rodeo, Georgia Satellites. Yeah, I forget now because you did make me think of one that I would have included on my list, and now it's gone. But um, yeah, I looked up the Georgia Satellites. Yeah, because I never heard of it. It's on the second album they did. Okay. Yeah, open all night. But yeah, I'm trying to think now. Um, when you said Sweethearts of the Rodeo, you made me think of something else. Anyway. Oh, I didn't mention Ann Murray. You know, Ann Murray covered a few Beatles songs, but she had a major hit with You Won't See Me in yes. 1974. And I, I even remember she was at the Grammy Awards in 75, and John Lennon was there, and John said, nice work on You Won't See Me to her. Cool. So those are my choices. But I'm sure that Alan's going to mention quite a number now that I wish I had mentioned, but... You never know. Well, we know one of Alan's. Yeah. I'm not, so now I can skip that one, save some time. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I want to mention three albums first, quickly. Um, I'll start with the silliest one, which I don't even know if I should think of it as an album because I can only listen to a couple of tracks from it at a time. But that is the Chipmunks sing the Beatles. I love that. <laughs> what can I say? I'd love to sit down and watch you listen to that album. It's it's ridiculous, but it's fun. Um, let's see what else. Uh, up the Smithereens have a couple of Beatles covers yeah. albums, yeah. and um, I didn't I include it. individual songs because I thought you know they're sort of it's it's like too well known at this point. I mean, and they had done a bunch of Beatles covers even before. Um, I guess Meet the Smithereens was the first one right. with a cover and... of the Meet the whole Meet the Beatles album. Right. Um, and what I liked about it is, well, like what Ken said, you know, it's not just slavish, you know, copying of the Beatles versions. It's it's very close to the Beatles versions, but it's definitely the smithereens, too. And uh, so I really like that. And um, and then they did a, a, a second uh, Beatles compilation, which was B-Sides. Right. Um, and they I did the third. What? They did, did, they did the um, set list of the Washington... Oh, yeah, the first album in DC concert, which oh. I think the Smithereens did the set list and put that out as an album too. They yeah. may have yeah. sold that. Yeah, Most they made it. They made it sound like a live album that was all done in the studio. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and they recorded "Love Me Do" with Andy White playing drums. Right. So mm -hmm. I don't even know if that counts as a cover, since twenty five percent of the people were the same people. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, and the third one, which is an album. I absolutely love is called the Baroque Beatles book by Joshua Rifkin. That's Joshua true. Rifkin at the time was a young guy just out of, uh, you know, music school uh, and working for Electra. And sorry, he was a, a musicologist and a keyboard player. He later became very well known for uh, recordings of Scott Joplin rags. Um, and then after that, he became very well known for uh, uh, some research that showed that in Bach's time, Bach only had the money to pay for single choristers for each part of uh, of, of the music that he performed every Sunday at the Thomas Kirsch in uh, in in uh, Leipzig, uh, and made a recording of the. Bach B minor mass with one singer to a part, which anyway, that's a whole other story. But Baroque Beatles book, what he did was um, he made arrangements of a bunch of Beatles tunes, but in Baroque style. But, you know, people do that and it's OK. It's kind of Baroque style. He had it absolutely down. I mean, these pieces sound like Handel and Bach. And he knew the Beatles stuff well enough to... Uh, at one point where he has like a multi-movement thing as if it's a cantata. Um, there is a place where a tenor sings a, a, a recitative, which is sort of quasi spoken, more sung, but, uh, and what he gave the tenor to sing was a page from one of John Lennon's books. I thought that was a really nice touch. Um, I used to play that album when I had colleagues from the classical side of my life over to dinner. And um, a lot of them um, sometimes expressed, let's say, a 
slight lack of patience with my Beatles obsessiveness mm. uh, because I was supposed to be doing what they're doing. And I'd put this on, I have dinner, I'd put this on and they'd be listening to it. And it would be so, you know, totally in Baroque style that it didn't dawn on them for a long time until they started listening to the lyrics. <laughs> And the melodies are there too, you know. You know the melodies, even though they're they're in Baroque form, um, they're right there. It's it's a great album, and uh, it was a long time till it came out on CD, and it finally did. And uh, uh, everyone should have that album. So, okay, individual tracks. Um, let's see, in some kind of random order, uh, can you mention the Mamas and Papas? Right. Um. Barry Maguire, remember him? Sure. Eve, Eve of Destruction. Destruction. And most people know only Eve of Destruction. But he did an album called uh, The Precious Time in 1965. And he recorded a couple of Beatles tracks on there. And one of them is Yesterday. And I'm almost absolutely sure. I mean, it sounds this way to me. So if you can look up the track and give it a listen, I'd be interested in what you think. I think the Mamas and the Papas are the backing vocal group um, on that album. And particularly on Yesterday, it really sounds like them to me. They're very sort of recessed, so it's hard to to, to tell totally. But it really sounds, you know, when you're okay. listening. Uh, okay, another um, weird favorite for me is a jazz player called Lal Coxhill. Do either of you know him? Yeah. I think he's a flutist um, and he made a recording of I am the walrus. And basically the song is chanted by a bunch of like eight year olds. And you can just imagine a bunch of kids chanting the lyrics to I am the walrus. Um, but apart from that, you know, why, why this means so much to me is, I mean, when I was, um, in school in Syracuse University, um, I was driving around in the hills in the country outside Syracuse very late one night. And um, I won't even speculate on what I might have smoked. Um, I wasn't driving. <laughs> uh, and this thing came on the radio. And I'm sitting there listening to these eight year olds chanting, you know, I am he is you are he is like but like a whole bunch of them and so they're not quite together and they're you know it, it just was really spooky um <laughs> and you know and it's great uh it's uh it's on a number of compilations one of them is called there's a the at least four individual discs under the title Beatles Exotica um, which have all kinds of weird Beatles covers, you know, dogs barking, um, you okay. know, someone reading Yellow Submarine in Latin, uh, you know, you name it, and this is on it. But that isn't the way, place to find this one because um, they cut like 30 seconds out of it and you want every last second of this recording. Um, so if you... There's a, an album called Looking Through a Glass Onion, the Beatles psychedelic songbook, which came out in 2020 that has the full track. Um, so that's Lal <laughs> Coxhill, I Am the Walrus. Um, let's see. I'm uh, writing all this down. Mm -hmm? I'm writing all this down. Okay. Um, here is, let's see, <laughs> this is a weird one. Uh, isn't Stuttering John one of um, Howard Stern's yeah. sidekicks? Well, yes. he made a recording of Strawberry Fields Forever that is quite good. It's, um, you know, the the introduction is on electric guitars instead of Mellotron, and it's very guitar heavy, very sort of crunchy and, uh, and, and punkish. Um, but solid you know it's it's a really good performance um and no stuttering uh, <laughs> there's a version of i'm looking through you by the posies you know that Me? i didn't know yeah and they use the outtake that's on anthology the one with that starts with the percussion you know right that um 
which is you know kind of an interesting choice you know uh and they do it quite well it's it's, it's some some beautiful harmonies in it and it's you know it's not an absolutely straightforward cover but it's not far from from the beatles version where is that from do you know it is on there's a compilation called beatlemania volume one okay and that's all covers but I sort of focused on that one. Um, Bobby McFerrin has done a number of Beatle covers, you know, way before, um, way before he got well known for Don't Worry, Be Happy. He did a bunch of um, albums on the Blue Note label when he was just being a jazz singer. But he had, um, you know, he was doing this thing with circular breathing and beating on his body, you know, basically the same things that he became famous for, but this was, you know, along the way to becoming famous. Mm. And he has um, on an album called The Voice, he has a really great ver version of Blackbird. And it's just his voice. It's it's uh, it's nothing else. And I don't think it's multi-tracked. I think it's, you know, because of the circular breathing and everything, he's just, it sounds like there's a lot of stuff going on. And he has a really good version of From Me to You, on an album called Spontaneous Inventions. Mm -hmm. um, this one is almost, uh, you know, too commonplace to mention, but you don't hear it much these days. Um, Deep Purple recorded a version of Help in 1968 on uh, Shades of Deep Purple album. Wow, I didn't, don't think I knew that. Yeah, and it's yeah. really- How did I not know that? It's really good. It's a very slow, spacey version. It's totally 1968. I mean, if you listen to the track and were asked to guess the year, that's probably what you would guess. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there was a lot of that kind of stuff around. You know, remember the Rotary Convention and uh, and and Rotary Connection. Sorry, mm -hmm. you know that who, who singer was Minnie Riperton. Um, but anyway, uh, and I was looking for, I could swear there was a Rotary Connection Beatles cover and I couldn't find it. Um, but so help had to do for, for that period and that style. Um, let's see what else. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, a version of Eleanor Rigby by Wendy Carlos from an album called By Request. Um, which was, you know, several after several albums of switched on Bach, she did mm -hmm. this sort of, you know, compilation of little arrangements of all kinds of stuff that she had been experimenting with. Um, and the Eleanor Rigby version is really quite beautiful. Um, and since we're going to be talking about synthesizers in a few weeks, um, mm. it seemed to be, uh, you know, a good one to uh, bring up. Um, it's it's a it's a beautiful arrangement. I mean, it, she was playing a, a monophonic Moog synthesizer, so it's all multi-tracked, and you know, has the orchestral part, the cello parts, and the the, the string octet parts, um, and the melody. But using the, you know, she she picks really interesting electronic timbres to use for it, and um, quite a lovely version. Um, do you know Thea Gilmore? No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Folk, folk yes. singer. I think I of. interviewed her at WFUV. Mm -hmm. Well, she did a really nice version of All You Need Is Love. Extremely gentle and, um, uh, the instrumentation is, you know, some orchestral instruments and, other acoustic things you know guitars and stuff and uh and it, it's quite striking too so um so i put that on the list i i didn't really uh weed it down that much you can see it's quite you know a bunch of stuff um because I, I thought we were supposed to pick five but then when the two of you were not keeping <laughs> it to five i thought well i can i can do a bunch of these and the i guess the last one i'll mention is uh a group called monsoon that did a version of Tomorrow Never Knows. It's I think they're an Indian group, but there are no Indian instruments on this. It's it's just you know rock, but it's some um, you know in, interesting uh, instrument choices, and they don't do backwards tapes. They have other things going on, I think electronic things, um, and it's on. Uh, there's a compilation called Lennon McCartney Songbook from 1982. That's on that. 
I pulled up something here <clears throat> about um, Lowell Coxhill. Hmm. Uh, the Wikipedia biography of him, um, at the end of it, says his son Simon, <clears throat> excuse me, his son Simon is a punk drummer who played with Acme Sewage Company. Gotta love a band like that and with a name like that. Uh, his daughter Claire is a vocalist and his daughter Maddie sings and plays in a ukulele band. All three children appear with their father on I Am The Walrus, one of the tracks on Ear Of Beholder <laughs> and later featured on the Exotic Beatles Part 2, which is what you mentioned. Yeah. And Ear of, the, Ear of Beholder, I, according to this, was his first album. Mm -hmm. And it was 71. So 71. is that, does yeah. it, does that, does that make sense to you? Yeah, I probably heard it in 72 or 7. Yeah, I think 72, actually. So those were his kids. How about that? Well, you learn something every day. See, it's a good thing we did this show. I would never have known that. Yeah, and I got like a new shopping list. Oh, sh to want my, yeah. more stuff I'm going to buy. When but I, got I, was, uh, I was teaching a criticism class at NYU, and um, every year I used to play them this version of I Am The Walrus, the Beatles version of I Am The Walrus, and um, also there is a... Uh, well, there's there's a... A Japanese pianist named Aki Takahashi, who did four discs um, called Hyper Beatles. And what she did for Hyper Beatles is she commissioned contemporary classical and avant-garde composers to do arrangements of Beatles tunes. And so um, Terry Riley, who was one of the you know founders of the minimalist school, basically did a version of I Am the Walrus. Or I think it was called Walrus in Memoriam, um, but it was based on I Am the Walrus. So I'd play them all three of those and have them write something about you know comparing them. Um, and the, the Aki Takahashi set too, if you're interested in classical and avant-garde stuff, you should really check hers out. John Cage did, um, the Beatles 1962 um, to 70, I believe, uh, where he just took bunches of, of themes of Beatles things and, and wove them all together in this sort of, just sort of a big thing. And, uh, there was a, a composer named Alvin Lussier who, uh, um, I think died last year. I think I wrote this over. Um, anyway, uh, he did uh, a version of Strawberry Fields Forever, which he played on the piano and recorded on a cassette recorder, you know, on the edge of the piano. And then the second half of the piece is he put the cassette recorder inside a teapot and played it back. <laughs> anyway, well, maybe he had to be there. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so there's, you know, there's like a, there is no end to things people have done with the Beatles catalog. And, uh, you know, a lot of it is is absolutely great. A lot of it is off the wall. A lot of it is just copies of the Beatles. You know, it really runs the gamut. So, um, so it's a huge world out there. I wanted to ask you one thing about Joshua Rifkin. Hmm. Um did you find that there were certain Beatles songs that he gave this Baroque arrangement to that you were surprised worked as well as it did? I mean, when I think Baroque, I think for no one, I think Penny Lane, you know, yeah. maybe there are certain Beatles songs in there that. And this was before this was this came out and I think it was done at the end of 65. So, oh, wow. so all that stuff, it was too yeah. early. for. Um, but for instance, um, one of the, uh, one of the cantata arrangement kind of thing. So we're talking about, you know, orchestra and chorus. Um, he has Please Please Me, you know, and you can picture it. Da, 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 da. You know, it, it's a it's a, a, a tune that works in a Baroque setting. And right. Um, yeah. And, you know, another thing almost like that, it's not quite like it, but it, it reminds me of certain aspects of some of Peter Sellers Beatles covers like, you know, Hard Day's Night Help. Uh, he did a few. Um, 
and the help one was great. The help, he, he did them as characters, you know, and help. He was like a, a pastor in a church, you know, and they're going to pass the collection plate at the end. And, um, you know, and, and you can, he, he does it, you know, help. <laughs> I need somebody, not just anybody, you know, he <laughs> and he has, um, I think, three or four versions of She Loves You. He has a Cockney one. He has one that's uh, in a, a German accent, uh, uh, like, you know, as if he's Dr. Strangelove doing it, you know. Um, if, if you don't know the Peter Seller ones, everyone out there, um, they're they're compiled on lots of different compilations. And uh, uh, there is actually a CD single that was released several years ago with several of them. Um, but they're definitely worth looking at too, because they're very funny. They're very funny. Anyway. Yeah. That's yeah. another thing talking about comedy records, you know, that we comedic versions of Beatles songs too. Mm -hmm. By the way, since I mentioned stars on 45 before, when it comes to medleys, I should have mentioned Harry Nilsson's. Mm. You can't do that, which he did at the very beginning of his career, right. which was really ingenious for its time. Mm -hmm. mixing uh, the titles of a lot of Beatles songs and building it around You Can't Do That and uh, some of the melodies of other Beatles songs. It was all interwoven in a way that I don't think anybody had really done that. Mm -hmm. Also that Barkley James Harvest song called Titles. Titles is great. <laughs> yeah. But that's that's a completely, um, you love it? I love them. Oh, okay. I don't know. I wonder if I know that. I'm all these notes. I like got a lot of shopping to do later and looking at things up. Yeah. See, that's no, I, when they asked me, "Would you like to join things we said today?" I thought, "Ah, I learned something." <laughs> so I've got all. But Barkley James Harvest, the 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 song titles, which was released as a single, is just titles of Beatles songs, but they built a whole melody of their own around it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's beautiful. It really is. It it, it all flows together extremely well. And uh, I would definitely look into that. There's so much you can explore on YouTube. Check out all the songs that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, and I also wanted to bring up um, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles doing and I, and I Love Her. And you can just hear it. You know, the golden voice of Smokey Robinson. Yep. Who still sounds great. But anything that melodic, you can just hear Smokey's voice. When I heard he was going to cover so bad on uh, the art of McCartney, I could hear it. You can mm -hmm. hear it in your head, <laughs> you know, if you know Smokey's voice, which is just so magical. But um, there was a, a compilation of um, Motown artists all doing Beatles songs yeah. mm -hmm. back in the 90s. Motown sings the Beatles. So you got the Miracles and the Four Tops and the Supremes and artists like those. So great version. Event I love her. All right. Okay. So that should we wrap fun. it up? That was fun. Yeah, it, it actually was. Um, I think we each um discovered some new tracks that we're yeah. gonna look up and uh and and get. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> okay, I'll edit that. Um <laughs> so um <laughs> I'll just leave the fuck in. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so shall we go around and uh, give our information? We'll um, start yeah. with Darren. All righty. Uh, you could catch me at WFUV Monday through Thursday nights. I'm on the radio 10 p.m. till 2 in the morning, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, at WFUV, which if you're in the New York City metro area, we're at uh, 90.7 FM. Um, or you could stream us anywhere, WFUV.org, uh, or get our app listen on the app so that's monday night tuesday wednesday thursday nights 10 p.m to 2 a.m saturday afternoons 1 to 4 p.m followed then by uh the program mixed bag which which is a program of the late great pete fornitales which is on fuv now hosted by don mcgee and look for me on facebook um i know recently there was a little flurry of uh, of you who um uh found me on facebook and either Send me a friend request at Darren DeVivo, or you could even 
go to Darren DeVivo, WFUV, DJ and Beatles podcaster, uh, I think is the name of the other page uh, that I have. But either one, I'll get you on the other and then you'll be connected to me. So those uh, those are way to go. Facebook for me. OK, Ken. All right. If you'd like to write to me directly, my email address is every little thing at att.net. You can talk about anything concerning the Beatles or, or especially Stars on 45 with me mm-hmm. at my email address. Again, every little thing at att.net. On my uh, YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, I just did a Fab Five show with Tom Hunyadi. Tom is my co-host on the Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast podcast. And he also is co-host with Andy Nichols of the Paul McCartney podcast called Two Legs. Whenever I do a Fab Five show, I ask my guests to name five albums, one Beatles album, one from each solo Beatle that are their go-to albums at the moment. The albums they feel like listening to right now. And they tell us why. And I also did a, a few panel uh discussions on my youtube channel recently one of which uh involved darren and um glenn burtnick from the weaklings and edward crawford who has has a beatles podcast show called call me mr broad street where i asked them to name five uh lesser known solo paul mccartney songs that are original songs although darren bent the rules there a little bit written or co-written by paul mccartney that uh, they feel deserve classic status. Songs did I... that are kind of obscure songs. How did I bend the you rules? Did a, you did a cover on the show. Oh, but I didn't include it in my list. And I just told you by accident I picked it. Don't make me look like a nugget head. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, we all make up our own rules here which you'll notice on this podcast and also talk more talk at times. But um, that was a great concept. And I'm going to do one on John, one on George, one on Ringo, do a Beatles one, too. Songs that you feel deserve classic status that haven't been the more obscure side, in this case of Paul McCartney's solo music. Also uh, on Talk More Talk, my other podcast, we just did an interview with Alan and Adrian uh, Sinclair. Uh, for the the new book, The McCartney Legacy, and lots more questions about what what went on during that period, 1969 through 1973. It's always great having the two of them on. It's great to just have Alan on to talk about this stuff. But uh, Kid O'Toole's on the show, Tom Hunyadi and Joe Mayo. And um, also my radio show called Every Little Thing. You can listen to On Demand on WFDU's website that's fairly dickinson university where they run the show sunday morning 6 a.m eastern time and then after that they put it on the website they make each show available for two weeks so go to their archives page uh, that's at wfdu.fm and type in every little thing you can get the last two shows of my syndicated Beatles show, Every Little Thing. As always, my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. There's Beatles trivia every single week where you can win one of 10 prizes, books, CDs, DVDs, including the McCartney Legacy, uh, live at the Greek Theater 2019 from Ringo and the All-Stars, the Beatles fully uncovered from Chris Engelhart. Lots of great prizes are there on the trivia page, KenMichaelsRadio.com. If you can, please subscribe to Ken Michaels Radio, the YouTube channel, and uh, talk more talk as well. Okay. Um, By the way, pretty much all of this info will also be in the show description on YouTube and Podbean. And um, the Podbean distributes to all kinds of other places. I don't know if they also distribute the the description, but if they do, all that information is there too. You can reach me most easily at face on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And there is a McCartney Legacy Facebook page. And we also have McCartney Legacy website. Um, one of the great benefits of watching the YouTube videos, <laughs> see hmm. me hold up my phone with our website. Uh, and that is uh, the McCartney legacy.com. And also just plain old without the, the McCartney legacy.com will bring you to the same place. 
Um, so, and um, yeah, hope you're following us on YouTube. If you are subscribed to us, please. And uh, otherwise we're available wherever fine podcasts can be had. And uh, so that was a, a, a fun show. It was two shows for me today, but this actually, uh, I was really tired after the first one. Now I'm more energized. So for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. 